Would y'all mind closing your video so we are not stuck in bandwidth? Uh, idea to get uh, to leave some uh, uh, reports available uh, out, you know, from the outside of the case. Nice. Let's take a look at it. Uh, is that on the dock, or can you take a picture and do a snapshot? Yeah, I can do a couple photos here. I it's really crude, and so I was going to actually try to draw it this morning. Um, uh huh. Call just like a quick. I'll use the the models we have for the pie, and then kind of add my thoughts on how you can get some of the cable out of the pie without um, eliminating exposure to all the ports. Did you say crude? If it's crude, you should definitely put it up. Yeah, well, it doesn't even have pies. It's just a top and a bottom. Okay. Well, um, please put that in the work doc because that shows like from zero to commercial product how we go through the process. So please do that. Okay. It's, you know, it's, it's a good explanation for, you know, to encourage people, people who are like, okay, how do we start this? Um, you'll show, you know, that this all shows how this process just evolves over time. So, yeah, do do that. That's good. Um, what else, what else did I miss on your side here? Just to fill me in here. Is that... Person. I was to get through some updates of, um, uh, I was, uh, I'm, um, been watching that awesome progress from Jeremy of, uh, reducing one of the power cables. I'm going to try and replicate that, uh, here. And I was just giving some of the updates on some of the software that I was, uh, I was there working on and figuring out. Uh, any hope of getting a really nice keyboard? Uh, yeah, Florence is a much better one, um, and it installs right throughout the Git. Uh, mm. You can resize it, um, so I've been able to customize it pretty well. I wish I could get the uh, Raspberry Pi to, uh, the touchscreen to work in portrait mode. Has anyone tried portrait mode yet on uh, on the Raspbian? No. The touchscreen, the XY doesn't doesn't invert. So when you flip uh -huh. it in, when you when you configure it for touch for portrait display, then the, the touchscreen. So the keyboard would be much more functional at the bottom of the screen in that configuration, I think. But you know, it it takes up a, a, a decent amount, but uh, there's a nice little uh, minimize as well. It hides, it, it stays on top. Um, has it's been much better than the Matchbox one. Mm hmm. Do you have that up on your Pi right now that you can show us? Uh, I want to see how that looks like. What did you say the name was? Uh, Florence. Florence. I'll, log. Um, I'll, I'll take a screenshot. And... Florence Keyboard Pi. Images. I see. Um, yeah, it's, it's still the pop-up, not like the native... Android deal. Yeah, so and to, to get like a nice like a swipe um, uh, type uh, keyboard, I mean Android does seem to be uh, the most supported, um, the best option. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, so I tried a, a bunch of different Android uh, options, including Lineage OS, which I've really been, been wanting to try on something. Uh, which is the uh, successor to CyanogenMod Mod uh, Android fork, mm -hmm. and uh, so it, that's, the, that's definitely the most well developed, well, uh, most supported, but they have not yet ported it to Raspberry Pi 4. They have a bunch of support for Raspberry Pi 3, so it's been around for uh -huh. a long time, but no one's rebuilt it. They haven't rebuilt it for the 4 yet. Um, it seems uh -huh. like that is what they're wanting to do. Um, supporting uh, Raspberry Pi is, uh, is something that they're doing, but yeah, so that's not, uh, that's uh -huh. not yet available. I have, and so I have the last one, well, I have two more downloading now, M M Teria, uh the industrial one, but it's definitely, is certified for non-commercial um, use, kind of. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Amteria, yeah, I heard of that one. Um, yeah. And the one that's prominent, the the one that was for Pi three and not four. What's which brand is that one? Uh, Lineage OS. Uh, Lineage. Is the best option. Lineage OS. Yeah. I have a I have a Raspberry Pi three here also that I, I'm thinking um, uh, I need to get. Another HDMI cable, but I want to. Uh, I would also try and unload that up and see if that is going to work. Because, uh, yeah. Also. Oh wow, that's like. Uh, is that based on Android? 
Yes, yes. So it's based. It's actually. Um, it's a, based on. It's a direct successor to Cyanogen Mod, which was a uh, an early Android um, open open source fork. So that basically developers were afraid that Android was going to get too closed down or too controlled. So early on, they forked it as Cyanogen Mod, and it, that was like the most oh, wow. developed uh, hacker uh, Android for a long time. And so the company had some some internal issues that caused the company behind it to to shut down. Uh, then the development fork to Cyanogen Mod um, or uh, to into Lineage OS to continue the project. And so actually the main purpose behind Lineage OS, as stated, is to offer a good, stable, continuing Android for old devices, for outdated, for, you know, other, uh, otherwise uh, uh, abandoned hardware, um, so that, you know, increased longevity of old Android uh, devices. Wow. Do you think there would be a case to downgrade to that, if, if that's like the best system? Because it looks like, wait, but the... Yeah, go ahead. It might, it might be, um, um, at least uh, temporarily, or like that is an option. I mean, one of the great things about this uh, uh, a tablet that we're talking about uh, is how this last phone you'll ever need to buy a build because it's so, so just one upgradable. If we can open the case and just put a new Raspberry Pi or an old one to run the, the software we want, and then when they support now the Raspberry Pi 4, we can mm. put the Raspberry Pi 4 in, and then the Raspberry Pi 5 comes out, and if we want to, to upgrade or the... Every, um, you know, we can, we, that is, uh, the design could have could evolved, uh, as needed. Yeah. But I'm going to, I'm going to compare the softwares. I'll try and get, um, hmm. uh, lineage going on a Pi 3 and, uh, keep, um, customizing and uh, working on the best, uh, Raspbian install on the on Pi 4. Um, mm -hmm. and we can, uh, yeah, compare and contrast. Nice. And then otherwise the, the version that we can definitely get is the stock, Android type, which kind of go, it's probably going to be like a little bloated, but that is available right now for Pi 4 or no? I haven't been able to. Uh, okay, to so to not, work. Um, not really. Okay. Yeah, not officially supported, mm -hmm. I don't think. Yeah, that's interesting. And then the long term evolution of this, what I could see is then, that, of course, there is the, um, the Beagle Bone, right? And that is mm -hmm. open hardware. Now, Pi is not open hardware. They don't show you the ultimate schematics of all the parts. Now, BeagleBone, the way we're designing it, if it's got a simple USB port and uh, a screen, well, you got a Pi and a screen, we can pretty much readily replace the Pi with a BeagleBone, so that's cool. And then, as maybe in the next decade, uh, Luke and crew get to develop the open source microprocessors that will be an open hardware with open chipset. Now, right now, your BeagleBone is open hardware, not open chipset, because open chipsets do not exist right now for any, any microprocessors. So that's just a comment on the long-term evolution of this, which would be good. Because imagine, like, so you've got this, like, right, right now the capacity is you've got the BeagleBone schematics, and you can actually go to a fab house, uh, a, well, a circuit maker place, where they they put all the components on you. You literally manufacture it yourself. That is doable today. You can do that. You can establish contact with a board maker, and you give them all the schematics because they're open source, and they they source all the parts, and you you manufacture your own line of BeagleBone. Uh, because it's open source and they they allow that and uh, on BeagleBone actually it's interesting I, I as far as I heard a lot of the satellites out there uh, in the telecommunication system use BeagleBones the argument there is you want hardware that's transparent and forever lived because for example for Raspberry Pi you cannot guarantee how long the hardware or software is gonna live really well hardware at least because a company does not release its blueprint so if you you cannot support it in the long term unless the company is around so that's why a lot of people for the long term applications like serious applications and research military aeros like space for satellites they they actually use beagle bones to uh, to do that and i found that from the founder of beagle bone i talked to him i try to get him into the steam camps uh, but he's pretty busy he might be able to do to work with us at some point uh, doing a steam camp if we do a short one so I can actually touch him, touch back with him on the uh, for the next iteration, 
since we're doing a shorter one. Yeah, well, that's cool. Uh, we've been here. We've been uh, doing several things here. We got the the light <clears throat> the light module with uh, so a charging system and a control system for the LED light. Uh, so it works. It doesn't work 100%. It works about uh, 70%. In terms of intensity, we're running it at 10 volts because that step-up converter only gets us to 10 volts instead of 12. 12 is the sweet spot. And then between 10 and 12 volts is a huge difference because of the nonlinear brightness. Uh, but that's what we can do right now. It works nice. We have a push button. Tom was working on a module to, to make a modular piece that can be added to the, to the Pi tablet. Uh, what's the status on that? Uh, you've got a part library for it? or? Yeah, I've uploaded most of it. I yeah. didn't get the uh, actual part for the... Uh, the LED component itself, but the rest mm -hmm. of it is up on the parts library. Yeah, so Tom did a good job. He <coughs> took out the individual pieces, which of which there are several. There's the there's the controller, there's the boost converter, there's the heat sink and fan, and then there's the the LED module itself, and a push button. Uh, several components, like four or five. So he's got that in the part library, so we can hack with that. Um, the, the heat sink is necessary there with a fan, so one of the 4040 fans and a standard heat sink like we use on a, on an extruder, we use that as a heat sink for a 10 watt LED because at the full power, I mean 10 watts is quite a bit. Uh, so yeah, we've got this little thing where we have a push button. Here, let, let's demonstrate just so you guys can get excited about this. Uh, five second video here. Uh, so we got this module. Then you click the button, so you, you can do that. There we go. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Uh, but that's, so we could have this little module where you have a little push button on the case of the Raspberry Pi, so you can use it literally like a functional light. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, beyond that, we, we actually did the welder experiment. So we, got, uh, we took two, 10 batteries and two battery packs, and we wound them up in in series to get 37 volts or 40 volts actually at full charge. Uh, we ran a little bit with a 16 inch rod. We got some sparks, we got a little bit and then we kind of gave up on it uh, after a rod got stuck to the, the work plate. But it, it does, you, you do get the bright light and start of a weld, but you have to be ver very, very steady with the hand to control the arc. And the batteries warm up after a few seconds, which they should, they were like warm, like maybe 90 degrees Fahrenheit uh, to the touch after a few seconds of emitting their power, but they hardly drop. They drop from like 4.1 to like 4.0 in terms of voltage and being fully charged. Yeah, I think, I think there was plenty enough power in the batteries to do it, but uh, we just didn't get good connections between one battery to the next to the next in, in the series connection. Yeah, that's, that's one thing. So this could work. Um, we could probably try that, but, but definitely, like, I would say to make it safe, because if you do a good short circuit, you can explode the batteries probably. Like, if you just stick the rod onto the metal and it draws, like, 100 amps uh, or, like, 50 to 100 amps, you can probably uh, get into a dangerous condition with the batteries. So probably, like, a couple banks like this where you're dividing. Like, the official cordless welder has, like, 48 batteries. Here we use 10. So probably if you quadruple that, it'll be quite safe. Like even if you get the rod stuck, it'll be still rather safe to uh, to run it. Now that, that get, does bring one learning on the rod holder. A typical rod holder has a clamp on it where you can release the rod. Now on this, in ours, we don't really have a release mechanism. It's like untightening the screw in the back, which is, uh, that will be too long for a dangerous condition. So. Uh, we did use our own battery holder, so that's that's cool. I'll get those pictures up. That was that worked well, uh, but it does not have a release mechanism. So that's actually I didn't really think about that. But yes, a release for the rod when you get a short circuit and the rod sticks to the metal, that's a short circuit condition. So if you have a small battery bank, you want to release that. Uh, typically, there's a clamp on one of these uh, electrode holders that allows you to release readily. Uh, so. Yeah, that would be an addition to make on that, actually, like when we go into the future. Otherwise, we talked a little bit about, there's these $40, like 100, 200 amp welders from China that, that are AC to DC that we're going to look at into 
for future events also to look into that as well because apparently the part count or the the cost of a basic welder that runs off a wall outlet which is very convenient is it's not high at all we i think we want to study those circuits a little more yeah so that's that's pretty cool um and then don don any updates from your side yesterday's progress you've got a couple of things um so i was trying to create a you know case for the battery and i ran into printing issues that uh I'm hoping to get resolved this morning. I need to print some new carriage parts so that my we'll bed that. stays level. Um, so when that's done, I should have more information. Um, I figured that the on-screen keyboard was going to start to go into a um, you know, more mobile OS direction because that's just what they're built for. Um, you know, you either run Linux as a desktop or you run, you know, a mobile OS as a portable OS, but it's hard to do an in-between unless you really force a round peg in a square hole. Um, so I was, I was looking up the, what was the other OS, Lineage, that sounds like an interesting, promising opportunity, especially if we can figure out how to potentially even dual boot or something. Um, hmm. You know, there's a lot dual of, boot. Oh, interesting. There's yeah. bootloaders. You know, eat the same concept. Um, Noobs was technically a, just a bootloader that you can choose to install from one image or another, or run from one in, image or another. We and have enough memory, right? That. Because we can put as large a, a micro SD as we need. Yeah, um, and even if you go up beyond 32 gigs, you just have to format it differently for yeah. sort of. The actual install or sort of operating, um, uh -huh, so it's definitely possible. Um, huh? You know, further, you could run a, you, know, you can allow that SD card to be your mobile OS, and if you really want a desktop environment, you know, you can plug in, you, know, you can boot from USB or even a network drive if you're going to be in a desktop environment and want to really sit down with a desktop operating system. Is it possible to switch rapidly between OS's or do you have to Just shut reboot. on and off? But, I mean, you've seen how quickly it is to reboot. It's like, what, yeah. 30 seconds? So it really has more to do with the, um, yeah, the bus speed pretty good. of whatever you're trying to boot from. Mm -hmm. So obviously the bus speed from the SD card is super fast. If you do it over USB, You'd want to make sure you do it over USB 3. You know, Ethernet would be a little bit faster. Um, but my understanding hmm. is both of those ports on these um, devices run over the same bus. The USB sort of vanilla is going to be slower. That is a different bus speed. So that's really more for just sort of accessories. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, there are options there. You just kind of have to be mindful of what are you really trying to accomplish and what can you, you know, Part with in that scenario yeah okay cool so today's our last day of uh, activity my goal here is uh, we, so we get the printer up running here but just to do a very basic thing that I can use right now which is um, just put the case around this we will keep working on a case uh, simply with the pie and a, and a screen and then the, the wires, so no battery. So we decided the batteries, like we really got to get clear on the power management so that we can use batteries safely without frying the board. You can power the board through GPIO pins, the, the onboard pins. So if we need power, it looks like we need power for both the screen. Uh, so there's, and the Pi, like separately. They uh, Right now we're using two power cords because with one USB power to the Pi, that's not enough power for the screen at times. At least that's been our experience here. I don't know if you guys are running with one power supply that makes the Pi work, or are you doing two power supplies, one to the screen and one to the Pi? Chris, how are you doing it? Um, I saw yesterday, slide. Yeah, Jeremy, you I came up with a workaround that you pull power off of one of the five volt pins on the rail. Okay. And, um, Oh, that's I good. That's what I was thinking. I just used a USB cord. I just chopped one end. I chopped the big end off and used the micro and, and wired the wires to the um, to a couple of pin 
Okay. Triumphs. Cool. That um, works. You tested it. That worked. That worked. It booted right away. Um, I've been experiencing it, and you know, the screen just draws too much power. It won't boot. So. Yeah. Um, that worked well. Excellent. Uh, can you document that for us to replicate it? Yeah, That's what I was thinking. Gonna, it's in my log. And Excellent. It's in the um, working document. There's um, there's a highlighted yellow box on the page about power and cables and whatnot. Uh huh. Okay. Let's see, where is that? I'm um, looking at it. Okay, there it's like it is. Slide nine. Okay, so. Depending on if it's been moved. So here's the theory. I just moved it on top since that's quite relevant. So let's just like keep shuffling, like between Scrummy, between work docs and work logs, shuffle your newest, always keep the newest information on top so it's most relevant. And that's cool. Okay, I like it. Um, now it looks like Scrummy shut down, actually. Like what I'm thinking is that platform was like, really unused like I don't think anybody uses it so I think they just like shut it down or something I don't know uh, hopefully we can contact them and, and ask them to give us the source code because I'm not sure if it's open source <laughs> um, but they that company ran that and I don't think they're doing it as a business it's just a little sideline cool I'll do that so yeah one power cord and with a basic case and a, <clears throat> and a pie mounted like yeah I'd like to just get it so I, I have this mounted mounted thing that I can use uh, for some things, but yeah, the keyboard kind of kills it. So as soon as we uh, get any kind of a working keyboard on this uh, functional keyboard, I can start using this as instead of my cell phone for a lot of things. Just as far as the online surfing, I do like like how yeah, you can definitely get access to the wiki, the pinch pinch functions, and all that. Really convenient. Um, so move forward on that. Um, okay, so a couple more things. So last. Last uh, couple of things, like uh, on the skill set from this this camp, uh, I'd like to formulate like a five or ten minute final exam that I'd like <laughs> encourage you to to go through, and that is, uh, and maybe somebody after reading this, uh, looking at this video, can document it on one of the work pages in a Raspberry Pi tablet working doc. But here's what I'm thinking. So I mentioned yesterday. So you need to be able to use FreeCAD, your work log, and yesterday we introduced the merge workflow. Actually, I posted a short video on that to the workshops page. But if you talk about mass collaboration, it's not a workflow where you sit on FreeCAD and you're the master CADs person, drafts person. It's a lot of people can feed, feed into that process. The files are unlocked. We accept things essentially like automatically, and then the maintainer of that would would uh, pull that into the main branch and make and call it the official thing. But anyone can contribute to it. We, we have low barriers to that. But then as far as pulling things into the final um, official versions, that a maintainer would do that. For a mass workflow, we need start start with FreeCAD. So, and then communicating that on our logs. So here's the test. Take, go into FreeCAD, uh, do, a, <clears throat> do a, a sketch, extrude it to 3D. So in other words, you make a 3D object then put a feature on it, and then put another feature on that feature. Done. You should be able to do that in a few minutes when you've got all the workflow, when you when you don't uh, have any confusion on where you're in edit mode, like close this document versus uh, being, in a view, being in a view video versus edit video. You have to understand the part tree because the parts end up going in, into the part tree. But it's a very simple exercise. You just got to get used to a very basic workflow. And I do suggest 16, FreeCAD 16, because in 18, you get all this trash appearing. And um, I call it trash because it's not really useful. You get all these uh, coordinate planes and body objects things appearing in there, which confuse the thing. You want to have the object like... For me, it doesn't help me to say this is a part of like part like body that there's an X Y axis. This is on X Y axis. I mean, you see that once you get into the part. So for new users, that's to me that's really confusing, and also to new users, you want to be able to look at part tree and parse it immediately without like having an excess overhead of two or three times more information for anything that you draw, which happens right now uh, in 18. It's got these axes and origins and and body objects that I think are confusing. They have a purpose, but we don't need that. I don't know. I don't know what the purpose is, but it's apparently for the overall all workflow. But we don't need that in our workflow. So 
Okay, so FreeCAD exercise, draw an object with a feature and a feature upon a feature, period. Export it into an SDL and run a print off it. It could be a small thing, just something that takes five minutes. Next step, put that in, a work, in your work log as a library part. So you know, you have to know how to upload a file. You have to know how to create a part library. You can use the, you can use the part library template. There's a page with that name. Uh, just input that so you have a visual uh, visual representation of what you have and a download link of FreeCAD at the bottom. Awesome. Okay, so now you've you've gotten the capacity to work individually now with some collaboration because you put that on a wiki and anyone can see it. Now the next part is very important. That's how we we put things together. Like Tom did all his parts, we can now riff upon the light module because they're in a the library. So the next part is merge. How do you take two parts from two different documents? So the, the next part of that short exercise is you've generated your file, pick any file from anybody else's log, and merge them together and upload that as an assembly. So that's really quick if you don't understand the process. The idea is there is file in FreeCAD. It's file menu, merge. And any two FreeCAD files lend themselves to merging. So do that and then put that up in your log and that's your exam. When you're really good at this, this should take five, 10 minutes. That means you're not spending time figuring out which button do I press, just the mechanically doing this, you should get as comfortable that this is not a pain or a big overhead, it's, it's very natural for you to do this. Uh, so you're communicating this publicly and you're collaborating by taking parts from somebody else uh, into the same file. So that process scales in a grand way. You can have a thousand people doing that. You have all these library parts. You should be able to pull them from anybody else's log or from other part libraries and make merged assemblies. Uh, the only trick on an assembly workflow is you can go into the working doc on a Pi tablet or you can go to the OSC Workshop's Facebook page or you can look at the page called Merge Workflow. We need to put that video up there. I put up about a, like a five minute description of what you do to prepare files for merging. What you want to do there is you want to eliminate all the history of a, of a given object which you have generated through, through your feature upon feature upon feature kind of a workflow which is a very common workflow. Uh, take just the last thing, copy and paste into a new document and save that and you're saving only that single object because a single object before it's cleaned up it will have the full history which is fully editable. Here, in the final assemblies, you do not care about that history because we edit at the individual file level. So we still have those files saved in our uh, version histories, the, the full detail file with, version, with all the evolution history, with all the features, how they evolve one from the other and steps. And then you have the final, uh, I call it in a, part, in, a, in a part library, I call it dumb object. So you strip down all the information, you strip away all the sketches, you copy and paste into a new document without porting over all the sketches, and then you've got your clean single object that goes into the assembly. And that way when you click on it, there's no controversy whether, like say you want to rotate, so you want to rotate and move things around in an assembly, that's the main thing, if you don't use uh, assembly constraints, which you don't have to. So power users can go look at assemblies, uh, like assembly workflow which is a separate workbench assembly workbench like now I think they have assembly 3 or assembly 4 we don't necessarily need that that's that's um, definitely do workable but we don't need it we can just move and combine things for the most rough rough kind of a uh, technical CAD designs so you, you basically strip all the info uh, work with that so when you grab an object and you say well, you want to rotate it it's not like two objects in a part tree that you grab one and you think you're rotating the whole thing but you're just grabbing a part of it so that's why you want to when you go into the merge workflow prepare the file so it's a single thing that has everything um, in it so either do there's two things to do uh, one is do the make compound function or just make copy so different things and then strip away all the the sketches from it, all like dimensions, like if you have a dimension item in a, in a part tree or any other things that are not necessary for seeing clearly what that object is. 
And then in the part tree, you want to do control click right to rename the file, so make it something sensible, like um, when we're working with the LED module, call that LED module in the part tree so that people know what, what it is. So, so the final dumb object should have a proper name in the part tree and be a single dumb object. Uh, so that's basically, you can see a little bit more about that in a, in a short video I did on that. But with this kind of workflow, you're now able to work together in a, in a grand way using very rather simple processes. Don was claiming that this is like <clears throat> the Git workflow is, is actually, this is, gets so complicated, it's like Git workflow. It's, it's definitely not as complicated as Git workflow. Um, I'm gonna say there's like, basic, it was basic principles. It's more complicated, but I meant that if you're going to teach someone a nuanced workflow, especially on a more and more legacy platform, learning Git has other dividends in other areas. Yeah. This is so highly specific for what OSE is doing that you kind of have diminishing returns. On what do you mean by um, diminishing returns on? On th the time to just learn exactly how you want people to document and manage free CAD files of version 16. I see. I see what you're saying. And it's so niche to this very, very, very specific way of collaborating that eventually um, Git is not going anywhere. More and more people are going to learn the nature of version control in that way. And the more you fight it, the more you will be off sort of on the sidelines. I'm not fighting it. I'm saying that it's and. We need Git workflow for more advanced things, and other power users can do it. But now but you're managing two sources of truth, which is the sort of single greatest failure in any software mm. architecture. Okay. Uh, so we have to figure out a way that the two sources are not conflicting. Uh, so automate some other processor, however we do it. Yeah. But we cannot get away from the wiki, given that Wikipedia is the greatest project one of the largest projects, we, we definitely want to use the wiki, we definitely want to use FreeCAD, uh, we want to use Git for advanced workflows, and, and once we have, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really, in all these games here, in all this process, it's always and, and different people can, can go into the different parts of the, the process, so that's kind of the comment here. Uh, okay, so that's something like, if you can do that, what I described right now, and it's just like like a page or two of instructions, where of course then if you have to know FreeCAD, I mean you have to learn a little bit on that, how to navigate the wiki, or you know, we didn't really include the the docs in here either, in this um, so-called final exam, but yeah, there's uh, basics you have to know, but they're very I'd say generic skills like. FreeCAD, if CAD goes forward and it goes open source, then it's going to be FreeCAD. Wikis, wikis are not going away. And then like Google Docs or live other live editable Google Doc equivalents, those are, I'd say, pretty generic skills. And we're combining them into one package um, to make them work for a large team. So try that and see if you can do that in a rapid way where, where you're just not getting stuck on, oh, how do I get from edit to, to view or whatever in FreeCAD. Okay, great. So, yeah, that's cool. Um, last thing is, um, can we talk a little bit about, like, maybe the, since this is the last day, and I'm not sure if we're going to see the other people later, because uh, they're going to be asleep. Um, any comments? I'd like to maybe see some feedback on the overall wor all workflow, because the next time around, assuming that I like I'll be in Hong Kong assuming that that's feasible because of disease um, the virus out there but if we do a four-day event yeah I think there's a lot of good stuff we've got here and I, I'd say we keep about 75 percent of it or most of it and and change 25 percent but basically the change is evolution like getting this tight and streamlined so that we can have a better and more productive event and it's definitely like way way more content than we can handle and then let's see what we learn from here but what what would be a good schedule that looks like right now 
So I'm pretty clear about the first one and a half days. Um, but then after that, it's like we have a lot of options. So for the first day, introduction and the 3D printer are absolutely clear. We want to do that. And then on the second day, we want to start talking once we have the printer, how do we design things in FreeCAD? So that's one and a half days. But then what do you guys think for the next two and a half days? Up for comments here, so I'll take notes. What are your, what are your impressions on what we should absolutely keep, improve, completely throw out, or other suggestions? Uh, so first, I would say... Um a uh, chance to, like for the rest of the time, a chance to uh, have some, uh, continue practicing basically as we're building um, on the skills, like have small little uh, uh, opportunities to, to go back through all the previous workflows again and again um, and, uh, and, and so, um, mm -hmm. right, go by the skills. Okay, that's a good one. I, I yeah. think we, we underplayed so that one. Times, um, you know, we had a lot of days to, to print things and play with the printers to get things really dialed in and understand how they, they operate, not just how they function. Um, and I think it's beneficial for those first four days to try to, to focus on things where you have to generate parts on the printer so that so that people get a chance to really interface with it. Um, since they're not going to have as many days total to ask questions, you know, I still mm -hmm. have an occasional question that I post out there about how it operates, uh, mm -hmm. how to make it operate. Right. And yeah, so practice using in practice. Sorry, go ahead. It's right along what Chris said, but yeah, especially with, you know, focus on things that, that you practice the skills and then you generate, like, and you have a chance to operate that. Again, it's right along practice, though. Again, yeah. I, I think actually, again, getting uh, the printer, um, getting uh, the plotter capability of it, or like just learning about a uh, plotting, uh, um, even if it's taping a pen to the outside extruder, or working on that design to, to get the, the, the plotter part, was really helpful also in uh, going through the, the, the workflow again and a little bit differently, dive a little bit little bit deeper under the hood, looking at the actual you know, G code, but and that process helps uh, continue to calibrate the printer and get your, your operations of it, get the game confidence. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think yeah. yeah. So that exercise, for example, includes the CAD workflow. There's logging, looking at G code, continue to calibrate. Anything else? Uh, for the plotting, um, just drawing some some shapes was really really cool and empowering. But once we started uh, started going over to uh, the uh, Arduino circuit um, sketch that uh, that Belgium put out, seeing that thing plot. Uh, you know, in the marker, um, the, the actual circuit, even if it's not a functional circuit yet, is building directly towards, uh, um, you know, the Arduino stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so that's good. That could be, that, that is a lot of time curriculum. Um, I guess I'm, what I'm not seeing, and we, oh, we weren't able to do much uh, at all on this side of the Arduino building. Um, so in a, in a four-day uh, timeline, um, it's pretty crap. Uh huh. Don's got some comments. Um, I guess for the truncated session, do you have a succinct sort of narrative of what you're trying to accomplish? Even well, I mean, the narrative is same as here, which is getting your hands. The general narrative is we're getting our hands on a on a multi-purpose CNC machine, and around that is design and collaboration workflows and the ability to scale or modify these things as needed. And that's, that's the general narrative. So we get a general skill set for collaboration and then physical prototyping that we can engage with. So um, remember we talked about sort of features and benefits briefly a little while ago? Mm -hmm. To me, those are features of the experience that you're offering. What mm -hmm. does this allow them to then do six months after you're gone? What is the sort of human impact of this experience going to be? Mm -hmm. um, one, one of the things that come, sort of comes to mind is it would be really handy to have um, something of a just random, or may, maybe you don't have to come up with it, maybe. I mean, maybe go out to some of the sort of part catalogs that are already out in the world so that you don't have to spend time 
running free CAD if you don't want to, but maybe people are more interested in mm -hmm. really getting tuned up on just how the machine works. Um, FreeCAD doesn't have to be a dependency on operating the, you know, printer, assuming you get good designs from someone, right? So maybe there's value in just going out into the world and seeing, you know, what are some high quality designs that we can either clean up or just make sure that are going to come out as a quality print based on the nozzle head and the filament size and all that. Um, but you know, part of an enterprise of running a printer doesn't have to rely on doing your own modeling. Um, mm -hmm. Especially as this becomes more and more of an accessible sort of technology and sort of standard people are getting into. Mm -hmm. um, so it may be just a good sort of even hour exercise to have people go out on the internet, find something that sort of looks cool to print that is going to work for a you know one point two nozzle head, and is a you know sub thirty minute print, and just learn working with other people's models. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and you know, in addition to that, um, with, uh, some of the assets that we've generated. Um, like a uh, chunk screwdriver is, it would be a perfect uh, a, a place to start and other things like that that we can either design through these camps or like you say cultivate from other open source uh, um, repositories of good useful prints short to have yeah. uh, ready to go. Um, you know, like we were mm -hmm. talking about last night, you know, one of the things that I'm still really learning and getting sort of just dialed in is the tolerances of a, you know, print output, you know, mm -hmm. especially based on the nozzle sizes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when we're trying to do stuff like, you know, this, that is certainly possible, but, you know, the difference between doing it on a, I mean, take time out of it, as do, the difference between doing it on a 1.2 nozzle and a 0.4 nozzle, Oh yeah. Um, you know, the tolerance is very, very different. Very. And so, not just understanding that it's different, but how different is it? You know, yeah. what does that mean for my, you know, modeling? It'd be actually, it'd be cool to print the same part on two different printers with two different nozzles and mm -hmm. settings, and then take use a caliper and, like, actually measure mm -hmm. the, you know, tolerances and how it comes out differently mm -hmm. so that people can understand, oh, wow, when I model this, like, I have to plan for, you know, an additional 5% sort of overhang you know based on just how the extruder works right yeah a lot of that is that so that's referring to the data collection on on specific production engineering that comes out of the different nozzle sizes very valuable yeah that's a that's a valuable exercise to get baselines of performance because that's probably going to be one of the first things i do yeah when i get home is mm -hmm. just learn like what are the the max and min sort of tolerance of these different nozzle mm -hmm. sets so that I even know how to approach modeling. I can I can model stuff in FreeCAD, but if it doesn't come out the way I thought it did, there's too many variables for me to know what failed. So I want to try to narrow some of those down. Part of that is going to be during the process of building the parts for the G3D Pro. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But so I'm trying to sort of merge, you know, learning more about the process along with getting parts out that are a little bit mm -hmm. tolerant in mm -hmm. the you know, goal of setting up a yeah. new more production ready printer. Yeah. Yeah, I mean right now we are working on extreme conditions. Nobody prints with one point two nozzles as their practice. Now we're doing it for two reasons. One is the speed, like right now we crank things out in a second. Uh, now I notice for example on the battery holder like the thing, even though I put printed a whole bottom, like the thing yeah, stayed on a bed, but it actually broke midway because the stress of the uh, the 1.2 nozzle or whatever, uh, yeah, quality control issues. But 1.2 is going to be much harder, but it's faster. So definitely you get the much improved and detailed and um, better results with smaller nozzles, but you have to weigh the time. For us, it's we want to print large things like construction panels. So we're talking about yeah. 1.2 nozzles and larger, with probably larger filament, like 5 millimeter filament that we'll start extruding soon. But if you're telling um, people, 
I can use the universal so compared to the bow. It's easier to print with, or at least yep. easier to build a printer uh, uh, at the lower resolution. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Don. Oh, I was just say that you know, if part of your sort of marketing and expectation setting is you can use the universal printer to print parts for the Pro. Yeah. But you're doing it at a 1.2 nozzle. Yeah. You know, we had a lot of issues trying to melt and squish and you know create some forgiveness in yeah. some parts that you know were otherwise unforgiving. Um, and it's caused some other sort of downstream yep. effects about, you know, yeah. yep. this is no longer a level sort of print, you know, surface. And so now magnets are out of whack. The bed, you know, level is sort of goofy. And so that's, I, I think the quality control element is yeah a good thing to teach and not only refine, you know, for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've done the, the corners for the d3d pro on the universal back in november so we know that works and i was like yes we can get them to stay on a bed and using the 1.2 with 0.4 layer heights gets you enough enough control and the overhangs there are quite manageable so that was actually a really good thing and we know that we can also do the parts but right now the parts the only thing that needs to change we need to rescale or just modify slightly the carriages which are not just not fitting the the bearings right now with the 1.2 nozzle so that's one development point and we can probably like nail this right now probably the simple solution is like 103 percent on the carriage parts that that eliminates the problem so but we just haven't uh done this so that's cool uh tom what are your comments on what you think worked and what didn't regarding curriculum any suggestions <coughs> you'd like to see more of or less of I like the whole curriculum. Uh, it seems to to have flowed according to the initial, uh, you know, you know, timeline that was given for it. And I, I like all the materials that were done. It, it, we we seem to hit a lot of stopping points, though. These, as Martin calls it, stuckage points. Um, and and uh, what I'd like to see is, is these things resolved so that uh, we we can just you know move according to the schedule and to to achieve the outcomes in, in a more timely fashion. Uh, I, I think everybody would, you know, of course. Have, a, have a better experience with that. But but what that's really going to require is that everybody who's going to lead a STEAM camp needs to be familiar with all that. And and uh, we, we, they need some hands-on experience doing all these things. And, and that's including myself. Um, so anyway, but yeah, yeah, I think, uh, you know, the, 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 there's a lot that can be added as far as 3D printer. That would be simple additions to have uh, a nicer packaging and, and make you know, updates here and there and, and to be able to print. Nicer the, packaging, what do you mean by that? Um, well, I mean, of, of things like the 3D printer electronics, maybe have a little uh, better packaging. I think the one thing we need to work on is the footing of the... Uh, Z-axis. Uh, I think that that would help to have that to where it, because we had we had our Z-axis uh, uh, rods. They they were they were kind of moving in the wind, you know, rocking back and forth. The the uh, it it, it in, anyway. There there's a few refinements that could be made on that. And then also hold on uh, a second. Packaging. You mean product development, like better product quality, or actually you put it in a nice scumbag. <laughs> I mean, what do you mean? No, it's no, no. I, I mean the, the the printer itself. I'd like to see the z-axis on a more stable footing, because uh, we we we've, we've had okay z-axis on a more stable footing. Yeah. Um, the 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 flat. I think the flat um, plastic support member for the z-axis. Uh, it, it, it some of them were bowed, and and, okay. and 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 so what I'd like to see is instead of that be a totally flat surface, I'd like to see little uh, feet that were stand out from the the most of the flat surface but those would be the anchor points where it would be screwed down and and so that would then that would eliminate you know the problem if you don't have a totally flat surface you know you can still screw down the corners of it and uh -huh. it'll, it'll be more stable mm -hmm. um I, that that that's key to to that that you know the stability of the z-axis and prevent uh you know the tower from moving around side to side. Of course, it, it may be better still. I mean, it, I'm I'm kind of thinking that that it might be better just to go with the pro instead of the uh, universal anyway. 
Sure. Kind of doubles the build time though. That's the only trouble. Yeah. So you're talking two days instead of one. No, but you and can, one. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that, well, that's my thought. Uh, like uh, iter design iteration ideas of what I'm wanting to, to work on the D3D um, uh, universal as well, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's gonna be part of the process. Yeah. Yep. But uh, you know, and and these these things, uh, we need to move. Before we start another steam camp, we need all of the things tested. We need to know what's going to work before we go out and, and do it. Say, say like the welder, uh, say like the light module. We need to have a, a PC board layout already done and tested, and, and you know to where we can, you know, just just easily assemble it. Because that these these are things that we need all of this to flow a lot lot easier without all these uh, stuckage points. Because mm -hmm. I I see us we burned a lot of time doing that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as a first time, yeah, good learning experience. A lot of that, and of course, um, we're once again, as all the time, just the, the amount of development it takes to coordinate all of that is it's pretty intense. For we're trying to pack in a short period. Um, yeah. Anything else? Any other comments? Oh, one other thing. I've been doing a little bit of research on. Um, ways to have some sort of asynchronous chat so they having these video conferences are, are really good mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little bit later it would have worked uh here so we uh, would have been a little bit more more set up but to have some sort of asynchronous chat that was just ongoing um uh so I, I was looking at some modules for embedding into the wiki or maybe really making use of the talk page or some sort of forum option on, or irc kind of chat i'm not sure what the, what the best thing is but i, I feel like um we were a little bit split on different platforms and means of communication, communicating. Um, yeah. But, uh, I so suggest that, yes, something like that. Oh, uh, it's the IRC. It's already there. Oh, we should the use IRC. it. Yeah. <laughs> no, they're, there, they're... In the yeah. So yeah. Sure. It was at the top of every yep. major page that we're working on right now, and it's yep. just, by the way, it's a chat log. If you want to drop by the page, there's a flow of chats here. You see what the last one was. There's state of memory. Even if you left, you could drop a note. All right, cool, cool. I'm, I'm oh, let's see. Does that. let me let me ask this. But but the way IRC works, however, is when you log on, do you get to see the former conversation in there? I don't think so. Only from the time you log on, so you have to keep logged on in your session. But if as long as you keep your session up, then you have access to it. So probably right. Is, isn't that how it works? Guys, can you hear? So it's going to go much smoother because the, yeah. the instructions on and the videos. Um, especially if people can familiarize themselves with some of that ahead of time, um, since yeah. it's all out there already. Um, exactly. I think that's going to make the build go really fast, because mm -hmm. our build went, mechanically, our build went really fast. Um, we were down to electrical stuff, you know, early early afternoon, yeah. and then electrical programming took us like a whole nother day. Um, right. But well, now all the, all the diagrams, instructions, yeah. everything is out there already to get it get through that part of the process exactly well from the from the previous the previous c3d build the electronics had changed some and it was so all the most recent hadn't been as updated but the universal build the universal access has been built again and again and again in so many different forms you know both large and small um but yeah me mechanically uh, i think right with the new documentation that we produced in this camp it is going to make it go a lot uh faster. Uh, what was the specific suggestion there to point people to videos that already exist and materials that exist who are going to participate, you know, as much can, I guess, just show them, or make sure they have access to that and, and you know, encourage them to, to look over it. I spent some time looking through the CAD drawings ahead of time, and that really helped us mechanically know yeah. how exactly everything was supposed to go together. Yeah. Um, and how the electrical stuff is out there, and, and some of the programming stuff, we've got information on a lot of that, so yeah, I think it was through drawing and eventually routing, you know. Yeah. yeah no, that's true. Familiarize themselves in, ahead of time, as opposed to having to, to do it, you know, in the middle of the build. I think 
the builds will go faster. And I think no, I agree. Uh, definitely, definitely. But the thing that blows me away, though, like uh, the reality, like for all the workshops before, like you throw down a bunch of assets. There's only like one person or a few people that go over that beforehand. That's just how it works. But say, Jeremy, you, like you're one of the people that do do that. So, yes, we do want to provide all of that. Um, well, mm -hmm. I think that needs to be... I think it needs to be a requirement of anybody who's going to lead a steam camp that they they go through and familiarize themselves. Well, as far as the the people, right? Well, of course. So pass the exam. Each, each location that's going to do a steam camp needs one subject matter expert. Or really, even to do a remote pre-compiler session that's a video conference where you run through some of these things that are software oriented that is making sure you have you know whatever linux distro you set up or running <coughs> free tab basics or you know whatever it is to make sure that these upfront requirements that don't require you to be on site or have any equipment or whatever mm -hmm. can and then at least I be my perspective on that uh you know you, we did a pretty good job of communicating what was going to be needed ahead of time. Um, I didn't feel, I didn't feel pressured really to have to like figure out how to get anything up and running because because I had a good list ahead of time of what the yeah. requirements were for being remote. Right. My biggest frustration the whole process was probably when we were trying to troubleshoot not not having a good way on the first day of being able to get in touch with anybody to ask questions and having to just you know, power through with wiring diagrams online and, and trying to find information. So mm. I would say IRC works or, oh, what's the IRC or right you know, there? if there's some way to get that, in, um, especially for someone who's remote, you know, a more yep. instantaneous way to ask a question and know that, you know, it's not an email and you guys could be asleep mm -hmm. already and it might never, you know, it might not be till morning. Yep. So the addition of, uh, like the, basically the, the event page with the Scrummy IRC link to YouTube channel, kind of like what I showed on a flashy XM page on the wiki where it's embedded. You've got a bunch of different assets, organizational assets embedded in a, in a page so that everyone can access that. Yeah. Uh, should do that. Um, my comment would be the only thing like maybe we can, you know, just in the structure of the overall event, do, so, so people in Europe, for example, ended up developing the milling, which was pretty crazy because they actually started milling without breaking bits, which was interesting, and then the plotting for the circuits. Uh, fo maybe focus, as we restructure this, focus around additions, like, yes, reiterating the process. Maybe one addition would be, uh, I was thinking about a laser cutter head, which is, uh, you have these four, four watt little lasers that can do cardboard. I mean, that would definitely be interesting it's something to consider if we want to do that uh, definitely adds this other dimension of prototype ability which is that in, in flat sheet stock which is very good for rapid prototypes like like Jeremy you've done it yourself and uh, it would be worthwhile to develop that kind of workflow uh, I don't know for when in the future but eventually we that's one thing that I'd like to see definitely because uh, the other thing is a lot of people are very excited about laser cutters and, uh, and all that. Now we have Julia who's joining the team. She's built a large scale laser cutter, like two meter or so. Um, so she's joining the team. We can ask, ask her to prepare that material and see where we go. But yeah, just uh, as we go forward, keep evolving the pieces. So maybe laser cutter addition for the future, I would say just one thing. One, one uh, possible alter alternative we could use as far as uh, collaboration would be there's a mobile phone app called Zello. And, and it's, uh, it gives you like mobile phone access to where you can, by audio, you can uh, talk to other members of your team. And, and uh, the, that would maybe help keep us all in contact and coordinate through re remote sessions. Yeah, we need to have something where, I mean, I think the, the overall solution there is there's one video session on a gig internet line where there's a coordinator. Um, so if we have enough signups and enough revenue and enough resource, we can dedicate a person to that. I mean, that would definitely be a great addition. But something in the meantime, like if it costs nothing, uh, well, just making sure that we keep one channel just open in the background that we can, it's our control room. We, we can dive in there anytime. I mean, that's 
that's something we can, we just couldn't do that here with with the internet um even for even for super basic you know what we with the technology we have now you could just embed yeah. another um like a google doc for for communications and the most recent stuff goes to the top and everybody mm -hmm. you know either comment whatever and it's just there um, okay that takes that takes nothing and we can do it now yeah and it's real time 10 people can be in there typing at the same time and yeah it works great and you can tag people and ask questions which goes to emails so yeah yep that's good all right well um thank you for the feedback that's some good stuff we'll continue to develop this and um right now yeah let's see what we do in the last day i want to try to see if we can get the some of the things printed here like the case and um jeremy yeah see what you can do prototyping there but let's you know let's set up a call for like a month from now like maybe you know we're at february 2 uh, on the way the 20 22nd through the 25th but may, let's let's do a call like at the end of february uh who's got access to a calendar here uh, let's do a follow-up session where we the explicit focus is we're, we've got this Raspberry Pi tablet, and we're trying to take that to a meaningful product. Well, it's, you know, an open source product development session, a design sprint, where we coordinate on further development of that, where the outcomes are, okay, we've got the part libraries in place. Um, I mean, definitely, there's another whole part, which is called enterprise development around that, like product strategy. Like, what, what are we going to do with that? Is that going to be like some kit that we produce? Is it, can we produce something like a day workshop that really nails this thing? There's a lot of things we can do on it and, and it's up to us. I mean, uh, at the base level, it's getting the product to be pretty seamless, working out all the connections and, and chart power management and all that. So let's let's do that. I'd say, how about we do the, the 29th on Saturday, which is uh, about four weeks from now and check in on where we're at. So we continue this process, and in the meantime, continue collaborating. So we've got the, once again, the all the pages we set up here, so that should be live and continue to be edited, uh, which includes also the the Facebook, and uh, Facebook, that's it, besides the wiki and uh, your logs and the live editable doc, and possibly if Scrummy goes back online, I'd like to use that. Or, or just start talking. We, we talked about the new curriculum here, the events, the, the items we want to do. Start putting that on on the working working page right now. You know, just uh, start start doing that, and continue this process. Now the big build up is that we get the collaborative tool flows, tool chains, and tools to do the open source cordless drill challenge. That's kind of like the big picture scheme for September one is the is the intended deployment date for that where before we go in there I mean that challenge includes the idea that we're building a drill drill we're making a filament to make that drill and we've got a high performance high temperature printer to get us there so that means over the existing design we've got D3D Pro the improvement on a D3D Pro is a high temperature enclosure you can take a look at the wiki right now it's got a page called high temperature a uh, high temperature heated bed uh, something to that effect something with high temperature heated bed look at my log um, that shows a design of a basic workable system actually our design with the moving gantry on top lends itself relatively easily for enclosing that while keeping all the mechanical and sensitive components outside just the bed itself none of the belts or anything is in that chamber and the simple way to do that is by attaching a screen to the to the extruder a uh, uh, sheet such as PEI which is good for 178 C attach a sheet of PEI to the underside of the extruder and basically you're wiping the top of that chamber all the time so the chamber remains closed at all times that's a simple theory look at look on the wiki to see the diagram of that uh, I started doing a, a mechanic actually a free CAD design for the high temperature build chamber so that is on the wiki already there's part library parts in there take a look at that but i see that as being pretty critical for a professional grade cordless drill because if you have that 
then not only can you get very, very precise prints that have zero warping because you're keeping it at high temperature, but also you get access to high temperature uh, materials like acetal or other things with which you can make gears, uh, very effective gears. In fact, if you look at, there's an article on the wiki, I believe, the future of gears, uh, look at my log and search for gears. There's um, a lot of people are saying, hey, the future of gears is plastic because they are going to last, they don't abrade like metal. So if you have high temperature, high performance plastics, we're talking about access to, to gear downs, geared structures such as planetary gears or whatever else. And right now we can of course do the off shelf uh, metal gears from, from China. Um, you know, we, we'll mix and match available components to what we can 3D print and the power management inside the drill. We're learning something about, about the battery packs and charging and so forth. But that all gets integrated into the cordless drill challenge, which includes the filament making infrastructure, because we're saying this is going to be the first project that shows a real product and it's actually made from the waste stream. So a lot of information there. Um, so uh, the way we're building up to that here is the battery packs are relevant, the electronics are relevant, the 3D printing is relevant the scaling up of the or upgrading of the printers to the high temperature chamber and large sizes like if you want to do a, i'd like to be able to print the whole one entire drill in one print so you, that means you're going to have to have enough print area there to make that happen so at least one foot square bed probably not more like 18 by 18 inches which is uh, exactly what the universal axis right now is limited to, about 18 inches, so we can do that with the existing system. The um, thing we haven't tried in this camp is actually the high-temperature heated bed with a DIY nichrome heating element. Uh, that's also in there. But, but all these skills here, we're, we're getting to the much grander experiment of large-scale collaboration when you've got this, these kind of processes we're developing here. Um, a lot of it, we're, we're just keep evolving this. The, the docs, the wikis, the logs, the very standard simple FreeCAD merge um, version histories visual part histories on the wiki part libraries basic process that gets us to on a wiki pretty much a wiki based process like Wikipedia that gets us to a large scale development process so uh, we're actually are very ambitious about that in terms of creating a pattern for product development that doesn't exist that's, so it's about changing world economic history so we definitely got high ideals for what can happen with this kind of a process and somebody's got to do it I don't expect the current industry to do that because they don't collaborate. Um, the, dis the very unique distinguishing feature is the distributive nature here. We're saying like if we're going to do it, then everyone should do it because it's the best. We're not going to be protecting this from other people because we think in a scarcity mindset. We're saying we're going to upgrade the playing field for everybody so that we're leapfrogging and collaborating to solve problems. So that's the, the big picture here. And this definitely gets us on the way. So definitely uh, we'll continue the steam camps. In the summer, we've got the three months of extreme design build. That's going to be a more like deep dive session like this, but <coughs> with also bigger machines and building of structures like houses and building the big printers. So there the workflow is basically really work on the printers, make sure the high temperature printer is there, make sure that the metal printing printer, which is essentially a welder mounted to a one inch universal axis, make sure that is there so we can print large bulk metal items such as gears or couplers that can be then post-processed a little bit say on a lathe but or just uh, usable parts like metal tracks or gears for the actual tracks completely 3d printable as is with a state of art of wire additive manufacturing wham wire arc additive manufacturing that's a proven technology that uh, there's nothing new about that that's a, that's called a mig welder plus a 3D printer axis. Um, so that, moving on to some of the larger machines we aim to productize or at least get a really decent uh, near product candidate for the micro track tractor. And then after that, going into some of the construction to release a new iteration of the, the micro house, which has 3D printed panels, lumber, uh, CEBs, using a soil mixer that gets uh, on-site soil to, to mix uh, to do that for a very effective construction. Uh, so that's that's kind of general program and then actually build a, another iteration of the aquapana greenhouse that we have right now in the uh, the last month. So we're getting pumped up for this. It's going to be exciting. Uh, there's already a couple of people signed up on that for the whole summer from Europe. 
Um, but yeah, that's going to be a big deal. And that leads into the incentive challenge where at the beginning of September, we'll probably do a, like, a, like an intro session for everybody that wants to do an incentive challenge. We're going to hold like a grand opening. This is our like uh, incentive challenge steam camp. So we'll try to make that a pretty big deal. Uh, beginning of September, so like literally like when we launch this, September 1st, like September 1st through the 9th, do a major kind of a steam camp where we're getting everybody super prepared for, with focus, explicit focus on a cordless drill. So we'll start those five project days there with uh, all the stuff for the cordless drill. So uh, by that time we, we won't be much farther along with all the tool chains and everything, but just iteratively, inch by inch, making our way to, to doing this. So that's kind of the overview, overview and uh, here we're at the last day, just uh, finishing up stuff. So yeah, awesome stuff. I kind of like it, what, what happened here, because we, we did get some decent developments, like the Europeans and us here, just little developments, one by one. We're getting stuff uh, made and also documented. Like we're, we're trying to coordinate the documentation so the next people walking after us, they can have an easier time. Because I mean, for me, it's like part of this is you spend like days and endless time on the internet with stuff that just is all disjointed here. It's about upgrading the quality so that it becomes highly replicable. And then as a foundation for enterprise. So I mean, we've got a very unique uh, distilling mission where we upgrade the information that's out there. Cause we're, I mean, after all, we're not doing anything new. We're just trying to coordinate existing information to more access for a collaborative economy. So with that, that's that's about it. Any other questions or comments at this time? Then we'll go into the last day of our STEAM camp. No, just that this was fun, good work. I'm excited to do it again. Yeah, good stuff, everybody. Like you know, little contributions from everybody. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. So, uh, do we want to check in later on, or 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 not, or? Towards the end of the day, like 3 p.m. We're we're leaving here. We gotta leave for the airport at 6 p.m. today. Uh, should we check in or just kind of work and continue through the the docks? I I'm prone to just work and continue with the docks today. Um, okay. I have limited hours. I can be working today, and most of them have expired already. So. Okay. Um, All right. Yeah, I'll probably work more in the evening today. Yep. Yep. That sounds good. Chris, is Shang still there, or did he yeah, already no, he had leave, uh, Yesterday, he had to leave, head back to New Jersey as other personal um, things to, to take care of. But he had a great time also, and is really excited. He wants to come and help with the one, um, with the one in March. Uh, nice. And, uh, yeah. Wow, that's great. Awesome. Yeah, so we're, we're building. I don't know if you heard, Chris, but uh, I mentioned that Mitch Altman responded, and he's very interested in doing the Steam Camps. Do you know Mitch Altman? No way, really? Yeah. yeah. That's yeah, yeah, that, really that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm talking to uh, him uh, on Wednesday. Oh, cool. Where is he? Where, where, um, is well, right now he's in Mumbai, India. Oh, awesome. So, yeah, no, that's that's awesome. We'll, I mean, we'll just continue picking picking up people, upgrading the stuff, yeah. and just keep yeah. the ball rolling. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, this is cool. So let's continue and. Uh, towards the product release or or for me like I want to get this thing so I'm using it like within the next few days I want to be using it. that's my commitment I want to be using this so I can get rid of my cell phone which uh, I don't like using so I'm pretty excited about finishing this and then uh, making this accessible to everybody all right okay so go team go we'll see you guys later awesome take care guys yeah, yeah take care see you. take care bye bye <laughs>